it gets taken to the liver, my green liver. That doesn't look very healthy. Hello, welcome to Tala Talks Nikki. Today we're going to kick off our series on jaundice. And this first video is going to be on just some really basic definitions of jaundice. So I know that all these words are kind of constantly thrown around direct, indirect, hyperbilirubinemia, conjugated, unconjugated, cholestasis, jaundice, icterus. So today we're just kind of going to go through the basic pathophysiology and the metabolism of bilirubin so you can really understand what these terms mean. Then we'll go into the different types of hyperbilirubinemia including the immune hemolysis and then the last video will be on the management basically of jaundice. So first of all I really want to emphasize this point because it's kind of amazing how few people really understand why we care so much about hyperbilirubinemia. So hyperbilirubinemia is when you have increased bilirubin in your blood. And we care about hyperbilirubinemia, especially indirect hyperbilirubinemia, because if that number is way too high, then it can result in brain damage. So if that indirect bilirubin is above about 25 or 30 milligrams per deciliter and stays that high for several hours or several days, then that bilirubin will cross the blood-brain barrier, go into the brain, and normally settle in kind of like the basal ganglia or the cerebellum and cause connectorus, so cause bad brain damage. And the signs of connectorus is hearing loss, so sensory neural hearing loss, having athetosis, so kind of like abnormal movements, which is logical because it's affecting the motor centers in the brain. Also, it can affect the dental, the enamel, um, and you can end up with um, enamel hyperplasia, so it can really affect your teeth. And then on top of that, you can end up with upward gaze palsy. So you literally can't look upwards and everybody, these patients are kind of stuck always looking downwards. So connectorus is horrible. And the main reason we follow Billy Rubin in newborn nurseries all over the world is because we don't want that number to get anywhere close to what could cause connectorus. So now to go over the rest of the terms, it's really important for you to understand the general metabolism of bilirubin and in what ways can we end up with too much bilirubin. For now, let me just say that a high bilirubin or hyperbilirubinemia is discovered on a blood test. So you get the blood test, whether it's transcutaneous or whether you actually take blood and send it to the lab and you see an elevated bilirubin number. So that is hyperbilirubinemia. The term jaundice just means that you are seeing the effects of that high bilirubin on the skin. So jaundice by definition means that the skin has a yellow coloring to it. So you can really have jaundice when you have pretty severe hyperbilirubinemia. The bilirubin might be a little bit elevated, but you might not have jaundice. Icterus specifically means that you have yellowing of the sclerite, so the white parts of your eye, so normally they should be white, and if you do have enough of the bilirubin pigment deposition, then you will end up with yellowing of the eyeball. So just understand those terms. We kind of use them all very interchangeably because really we're kind of referring to the same thing. Okay, for the rest of the terms, let's talk about the whole bilirubin metabolism. Everything will become very obvious to you once you kind of understand what actually happens to bilirubin. So where is bilirubin coming from? And the answer to that, and I know a lot of you know this, is from red blood cells. So red blood cells, which here is in this vessel, when the red blood cell breaks down, so whether it dies or whether it's killed prematurely, it will break down and it will release free bilirubin. Obviously, lots of other things are released as well, like when hemoglobin is broken down, it's gonna release the protein and, and the iron and a whole bunch of other things. Pretty much everything else can be reused by the body, so it's reabsorbed and then used again. The bilirubin is a toxic substance, so the bilirubin needs to be excreted from the body. I just want to say this for everybody doing the neonatal or the pediatric boards, the last step in the breakdown um, to bilirubin from the hemoglobin uses an enzyme called heme oxygenase. 
In that process of breaking down that kind of final step to bilirubin, it releases carbon monoxide. It's really one of the only kind of enzymatic reactions in the body that will release carbon monoxide, but I thought you might be interested in that. Anyway, this type of bilirubin that is released directly um, from the red blood cell, and this is very important for you to understand this, is called indirect bilirubin or unconjugated. And you'll understand more later why that's called unconjugated or indirect bilirubin. So what's so important for you to know now is that this indirect bilirubin is actually lipid soluble, which means that if this bilirubin gets to a high enough number, it is capable of crossing the blood-brain barrier and causing connectors. So what we really care about is how much free indirect bilirubin is traveling around the body because that will tell us the chance of the connectors happening. So another couple of things that you need to know, the vast majority of this bilirubin doesn't necessarily travel completely freely around the body. It can be bound to albumin. So albumin is a protein in blood and it is responsible for carrying a lot of substances around the body as well as, as you all know, creating the oncotic pressure in the blood. So this bilirubin will be bound to the albumin which will help it be carried around the blood. So I hope that you're already starting to think of all the different ways that a bilirubin could be very elevated. So without kind of talking about this more, obviously one of the first ways would be if we had a really high number of red blood cells that were breaking down, or those red blood cells were breaking down much faster than we'd expect them to. What if, for example, you had a really low albumin level? So if babies are really sick, they're septic or something, they are going to have a low albumin level. Also, what if there are other substances that are binding to the albumin that are then throwing off the bilirubin pigment and allowing it to be free? Because the other thing that you need to understand is it's only the free bilirubin that has the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. So if the bilirubin is bound to the albumin, then we're fine. It's not going to break free and cross the blood-brain barrier. But if the albumin is all kind of busy taking care of other substances, then that bilirubin will be floating around freely and it can cross the blood-brain barrier. So things for you to realize that the albumin also carries around the body are free fatty acids. So if you have a baby on intralipids and they've got a very high bilirubin level, then that's something that you might want to consider actually stopping the intralipids because the intralipids can also bind to the albumin. Other things that can bind notoriously are drugs that we really try to avoid in the NICU. And the two biggest ones that will displace the bilirubin from the albumin is recephin or ceftriaxone. So it will literally barge in here, throw off the bilirubin, and so you have more free indirect bilirubin. So we don't use ceftriaxone or recephin for that reason. And then the other drug that we don't use for that reason is Bactrim. So Bactrim, again, can displace the bilirubin from the albumin. Okay, so now what happens to that indirect bilirubin? So it travels happily through the uh, vessels until it reaches the liver. So it gets taken to the liver, my green liver, that doesn't look very healthy. And then in the liver, the process of conjugation happens. So in the liver, an enzyme called glucuronyl transferase conjugates the indirect bili to direct bilirubin or conjugated bilirubin. So you can see here in the liver we have direct or conjugated bilirubin. So the difference between direct or conjugated bilirubin is this is now water soluble. Direct bilirubin cannot cross the blood vein barrier. So if you have, for example, liver failure and you have very, very high direct hyperbilirubinemia, you are not going to end up with connectors because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. I will make a slight aside here. 
and that is that direct bilirubin is also one of the substances that's bound to albumin when it's traveling through the blood vessels. So if you do have a very high direct bilirubin, then it will affect the indirect number slightly because it will be displacing some of that indirect bilirubin from the albumin. So that's why when we're looking at the curves to decide at what level we should treat babies, we're not just looking at the indirect level, we're looking at the total level. And the reason for that is because some of that direct bilirubin is capable of displacing the indirect bilirubin from albumin, freeing it up and allowing it to cross into the blood-brain barrier. But understand that point. Direct bilirubin is water-soluble. And so it is incapable of crossing the blood-brain barrier. But the way that we get rid of the direct bilirubin, as you all know, is down with bile into the intestines. Oh, that goes my pen. So these are the bile ducts going into the intestines. So this is pushed out this way, and then the babies will stall it out. And different bacteria in the gut will kind of work on that conjugated bilirubin until it ends up kind of that brownish color. The rest of that metabolism doesn't affect you as much, so I'm not going to go over it. I just want you to understand that there are two main types of bilirubin. Indirect, fat-soluble, crosses the blood-brain barrier. That gets conjugated in the liver by an enzyme which is called glucuronyl transferase. that gets conjugated in the liver, and then the liver is responsible for getting rid of that direct uh, bilirubin. So, we worry about these two bilirubins for two different reasons. We worry about the indirect bilirubin, because if that number gets really high, it causes conicturus. We worry about a high direct bilirubin, not because it can necessarily cause conicturus, but because it implies that there is something wrong with the liver if that number is building up. And when does that number build up? In cholestasis. So cholestasis literally means that there is no more movement of the bile. So for example, if you had a bile duct abnormality, if you have biliary atresia, if you have a really bad hepatitis where all, those, the, all the cells in the liver are really inflamed, then instead of that direct bilirubin nicely being shunted into the intestine, it will leak back into the blood and you'll end up with a high direct bilirubin. So a high direct bilirubin, you should immediately be thinking there is something wrong with the liver. So we call it cholestasis when the direct bilirubin is elevated. It is not considered cholestasis when there is elevated indirect bilirubin. Both an elevated indirect as well as a direct bilirubin will make the patient look jaundice or make the patient look yellow. Although I think everybody's kind of really used to a slightly more greenish color because it's kind of already conjugated bilirubin that happens in patients with cholestasis. So instead of that kind of golden, like yellowish color that babies with indirect hyperbilly get, it's more of that kind of greenish yellowish color in infants with cholestasis. So again, I just want to kind of reiterate before we move into the other videos, because if you really all understand this, then it will be very, very logical as to the different reasons why we end up with elevated indirect bilirubin. So really starting from the beginning, we can have a very high amount of red blood cells. So a kid is born with a hematocrit of 70. All those blood cells could be breaking down at a faster rate than we'd expect them to, whether it's hemolysis or whether you've got a bleed in the head like a cephalohematoma or something, and those red blood cells are breaking down. That will release more indirect bilirubin. If you have very low albumin or if you have any other medications that could free up that indirect bilirubin. You might not necessarily know that number by checking it on the lab because it's not necessarily always just measuring the free indirect bilirubin, but we should be aware of the fact that with a very low albumin, or if you're administering any of those medications or the fatty acids, that the amount of free indirect bilirubin is going to be higher. Now say we go all the way to the liver and we get to the liver and say this enzyme is not working at all. This, you've got some genetic defect, which is well recognized, where you are lacking the glucuronyl transferase or it's just not working very well. Or there's something that's inhibiting how well it works. 
then that in itself will slow down this whole conjugation process and again you'll end up with an elevated indirect bilirubin. So I hope by understanding all of this you will get all the different ways that babies can end up being jaundice. Okay so that was part one of jaundice. I really hope that you understood that. If you didn't, go back and watch it again because honestly everything else is going to be so straightforward if you get that. In the meantime, remember to like and subscribe and go answer all the multiple choice questions and we just want to thank you for being here. Thank you.